Welcome to today's national weekly EMS Zoom news briefing. I'm Julian Doe, co-director of Ethnic Media Services and your moderator for today. Today's briefing focuses on community healing, the relentless rise in racial and ethnic hate crimes, the front page news for ethnic media, Atlanta's mass shooting targeting Asian salons, brutal attacks on Asian Americans in the subways and on the sidewalks of New York, targeted shootings of African Americans at grocery store in Buffalo and a church in Charleston, shootings targeting Jewish worshiper at synagogue and LGBTQ person at Q club, cultural genocide of Native Americans in boarding school, and countless attacks against Latino at shopping centers and school. We could go on and on. So the question is, how do people and communities find a way to reconcile with horrific acts perpetrated against them? The families, the communities, let alone the ongoing trauma of structural racism and wars of genocide or state-induced terrorism. Is there a way to heal? What approaches can we share with each other? We are all grappling with these questions as journalists, and today we are honored to have four speakers sharing their perspective, research, and lived experiences. All agree on one key opponent, the importance of documenting and validating the traumas endure. Our speakers include Helen Zia, author and founder of the Vincent Chin Institute, James Taylor, professor of politics and African American studies at the University of San Francisco, and Nestor Fantini, co-editor at Hispanics LA and also adjunct professor of sociology and former political prisoner in Argentina. We turn to our first speaker, Helen Zia. Helen, this, the floor is yours. Uh, it's an honor to be on this panel and with the other uh, incredible journalists and uh, co-panelists. And so, um, as Julian was saying, this is a, a time of, of uh, incredible change, um, tectonic shifts that are going on that, in, that unfortunately have involved violence, division, and things that have um, have resurfaced a lot of the triggering that uh, brings back intergenerational traumas. And so I'm going to talk a little bit today about um, some of the COVID uh, uh, related hate and violence that's happened. Um, you know, the thing about these traumas, even if they are incidents that have happened long ago, um, they continue and, you know, they're absorbed in our, in our, not only in our psyches, but in our bodies, even though for some people it was new, for many others, it was triggering. Um, and not just Asian Americans, but violent incidents and hate of any kind. I mean, we, we have seen how there's a rise in that kind of hate violence and uh, killings that have affected every uh, marginalized community in America. The intergenerational trauma goes beyond um, you know, direct violence as well. We know that immigrants and refugees and the vast majority of Asians in America have come here either as immigrants or refugees, and many, in many cases have been fleeing violence. So to find that there is the, is the um, uncertainty of walking out your door and, and, and possibly being killed or having grandma and grandpa go for a walk and wondering whether they're going to come home at all, or uh, as well as the mass incarceration of Japanese Americans in this society, all of these have been forms of violence that Asians in America have experienced. And so there was nothing new about it. And um, however, we are in a period of, of now three years going on and, and no end in sight, because as long as um, the rhetoric goes on about China and Chinese people, being the uh, existential threat to America, we know that these kind of ha uh, hate attacks and violence are just going to continue. And, um, and so I want to talk a little bit about 1982. 
um, that's 41 years ago when there was another pandemic of hate that went on, except back then it was against people who looked Japanese. And a young man named Vincent Chin was uh, killed, beaten to death by two white auto workers with a baseball bat. And uh, it was a time when um, China wasn't the enemy. It was the view was Japan and America should send nuclear bombs back to Japan. And that was in the in the news, in the um, overall uh, atmosphere every day, a real climate of anti-Asian hate. And this young man, Vincent Chin, was out celebrating his um, bachelor party when the two white auto workers blamed him for the unemployment and the terrible misery uh, that the economic depression in the Midwest was um, was causing everywhere. And I was a young journalist then in Detroit, and I had been an auto worker as well, and I had been unemployed. So I saw the misery that people were experiencing, but the rhetoric turned the blame to an external enemy, and that was Japan. But internally, that meant that uh, all Asians in America had a target on their heads, and Vincent Chin was beaten to death um, with a baseball bat to his head. And so what about the healing? You know, that was traumatic for all Asians in America, the feeling that we were all possible uh, targets. And I got to know Vincent Chin's mother. I got involved in that to say, what can we do? Because the judge in that case sentenced the two killers who had done this terrible uh, hate killing in front of about 100 other witnesses. So there was no question that they had done it. And the judge said in Detroit, in a depression, in a city that was majority black and still is, that these are not the kind of men you send to jail and sentence them to probation. So these two killers actually never spent a single day in jail. But the tra trauma also triggered a great sense of inequality, of injustice. Um, what was that saying for all the Black Americans who are being sentenced to long prison sentences for even jaywalking, let alone um, for the Asian American community. What did this mean? So, so I got to know Vincent Chin's mother and her grief, which has been documented through a, a documentary called Who Killed Vincent Chin, was intense. You know, nothing for victims of violence and, and killings will bring their loved ones back. Nothing will bring people who have suffered violence um, back to, to when they didn't experience that. But what made a difference was a community coming together to acknowledge, to say, to tell the world, this is something that happens to Asian Americans. This was a terrible thing that happened to Lily Chin's son, Vincent, and to then begin to do something about it. So part of my work was documenting that, but also, um, being an active agent for change as well, and using my journalistic skills to to try to um, help the community have their voice heard, to have Lily Chin, um, who was willing to speak through her grief and, and really became like a Mamie Till for the Asian American community to say, this happened to my son, and this should not happen to any other, uh, any other family, any other child. And so, um, what happened was that she and the Asian American community were able to channel their grief through action, through trying to make a difference. And not just Asian Americans coming together, but reaching out and joining with the Black community, Black, Brown, Red, <laughs> White, and coming together and, and, and actually saying, we stand together against hate and inequality and injustice to any community. And, and actually began to link the understanding of what happened to Vincent Chin and all of the trauma that had gone on hundreds of years to Asian Americans and other people, um, link them together and to say how by standing together, we can actually make change. And so a new civil rights movement was born out of that, but also through the um, ethnic media first, which first publicized this, as well as then the broader uh, media, we're able to bring more attention. And the thing about acknowledging, 
recognizing, connecting the dots, showing that this was not just a, a one-off kind of thing, but linking it to history and showing uh, the context to other communities as well. So that was a healing process. And the community got stronger. It got stronger in very concrete ways. New organizations, new generations of activists um, working together against racism, against injustice, against um, against hate. And that um, that has been resurrected again today. I, I mean, I have to say it never actually went away. But in this new pandemic of hate and violence and naming uh, uh, different communities as the enemy, which, by the way, also divides us, keeps us apart, and makes it less possible to actually make change. And it's the change that is healing. Um, thanks. Um, so, uh, Professor Taylor, the floor is yours. Uh, I was saying thank you, Sandy and, uh, and Julian, uh, both for having me here over the last year and a half, um, along with the California Reparations Committee. Um, my work in it kind of was connected to um, something in 2006 that San Francisco did under Gavin Newsom uh, called the Slavery Disclosure Ordinance, SDO. Uh, and you can look that up online. It's actually um, an annual report um, since 2006 where every corporation in the city has to do a deep dive into their own records and determine any ties to, to, to slavery um, you know, traditionally, and they could voluntarily put money in a fund here in San Francisco, and that's been in place since 2006. The reaction to our efforts in San Francisco and in California, when we announced the $5 million recommendation to the Board of Supervisors and the mayor was from thousands of people, Fox News, uh, Larry Elder, Leroy Terrell, they found black faces to, to criticize it. None of these people have ever done any serious studies or, about reparations. They don't know about the Japanese internment and, uh, and, and Executive Order 9066 under FDR. You know who's strongly supportive of black reparations in San Francisco? The Japanese community is. They're the number one supporters of black reparations in San Francisco outside of the black community and the Jewish community is supportive. Those are the two allied groups right now. That And, and, the, and the Japanese community, I wrote an article about the, the treatment of Muslims in California, the police state in reaction to 9-11. And one of the things I discovered there was that the Japanese community was the, 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 the leading community to reach out to Muslims, um, you know, imams, uh, mosques, uh, because they understood what it meant to be um, a targeted minority group. I mean, there was 120,000 Japanese in Hawaii where Pearl Harbor happened. And they didn't get interned, but the 120,000 here in the West Coast were from here to Los Angeles. And that story, I don't think, is still fully understood by most Americans. And the fact that under Korematsu, it's still the law of the land. It could happen again because Korematsu was never turned over. All right. It was in the state. It was fixed, but not at the federal level. Korematsu is still law, a precedent. And um I think when you talk about, you know, reparations, one of the most important cases is what happened to the Japanese of California um, and the West Coast. Uh, it becomes, you know, since the 80s when Reagan and Bush, you know, came along with their $20,000 per family, uh, 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 you know, policy, it actually encouraged the black reparations movement to continue on because the black reparations movement, most people don't understand this. It was the original movement of black people. I was cited, I think, in the Washington Post this week saying that the original black politics after abolition was reparations, not integration. Reparations was the focus from the 1880s, the reconstruction period. There was a woman named Callie House. If you look her up on Amazon, there's a book by Mary Frances Berry. I'm sure some of you know who she is, uh, the lawyer, um, the legal scholar. She wrote a book called My Face is Black is True. Uh, it's the story of Callie House, a black woman in Memphis who led 300,000 blacks. Actually, she joined them. She didn't lead them. They were already doing it at the, at the community level. And then she and a pastor joined, and they become the leaders of this movement um, uh, eventually. And they sue in a case called a McAdoo. I think it's called McAdoo versus Jackson. I, I might be wrong. McAdoo. I, I know it's a McAdoo. I'm, I'm a little bit off on the case. 
uh, but there was a reparations case that happened. It went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has ruled on reparations and said that the state is sovereign and the state is immune. Uh, so we're going up against that. Um, but what reparations is supposed to be about and where it came from, it goes back to Cowley House. Uh, she had a larger following than Martin Luther King. Uh, she sued for seven years as a slave. She sued the United States Treasury for $56 million in 1899. She was arrested and incarcerated by the federal government over some bogus mail fraud that they used later to get rid of Marcus Garvey 30 years later. They used it on Cali House first and then on Garvey. People don't know that. Cali House and Isaiah Dickerson were the two leaders of the movement in, in Memphis. And they used the, the, the rationale was because the federal government at the time, after the war, taxed all of the cotton in the South under the Confederacy. And it was billions of dollars in today's monies. And they were using that money as a, 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 um, a, a, a retirement fund for uh, the soldiers, for, for the Union soldiers. And Cali House said, wait a minute, we picked the cotton, not the soldiers who fought the war. That should be ours. And so she sued over the right to that taxed cotton that was Confederate cotton that black folk picked that the United States federal government otherwise was giving to Union veterans. California is not about slavery. There was 300 years of slavery here of the Indian people. Uh, and people are ignorant about that. Blacks were enslaved here as well. Uh, and even during the few, the biggest issue for black Californians was the condition of fugitivity, not slavery. Being a fugitive in California, like in Canada, going to Mexico, um, the drug war, segregation, schools. The injury in California is not slavery like it is in Alabama. It's different, it's more nuanced, it's more complicated because the Chinese, the Japanese, um, uh, the Native Indian people all had their own encounters with this same white supremacist reality. Uh, and so just to wrap it up, we've inspired the world. There are 14 countries now talking about reparations. I told you New York yesterday, Boston, Detroit, Oakland, uh, uh, a Berkeley Unified School District, Berkeley City, Sacramento, all over the world, like marijuana and gay marriage, they were unpopular local movement issues from California, Oakland, weed, gay marriage, San Francisco. They went from those places as unpopular ideas and spread throughout the world. And that's what reparations is doing now. It cannot be stopped. London Breed can reject it. Gavin Newsom can reject it in California. They can't stop with reparations, the movement. That's going to be where people are going, uh, uh, I think over the next 50 years, pushing for this if they, until reparations is fulfilled as a way of healing the broken bones in the black community. I'll stop there. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Taylor. Um, I just want to add uh, one quick point is that um, the, the, the reparations to the Japanese community, the Japanese American community um, didn't happen um, without the support of the uh, black uh, community and also the black um, uh, political leadership. Our next speaker is Nestor Fantini, who was a prisoner in Argentina during the dirty war period from 1974 to 83 under the dictatorship of the military hunter, uh, Nestor, please. Thank you, Julian. Thank you very much for that introduction. And also thank you, Sandy, and all those who, who are part of this very this special uh, meeting. Huh? Before I start, uh, I, uh, please let me share with you that uh, as co-editor of Hispanic LA, along with the uh, founder and co-editor, Gabriel Lerner, who happens to be here as well. Hello, Gabriel. We are part of the Stop the Hate campaign. It's uh, being spearheaded by the state of California. Anyway, so when we talk about the uh, reconciliation uh, and also restorative justice programs that, that Julian mentioned, uh, we're not only talking about the uh, rational issues. Mm -hmm. We're also, also dealing with many, many emotions, mm -hmm. powerful emotions. So let, let, let me give you some background uh, information about myself and also about Argentina in the 1970s. In March 1976, uh, a little background here, uh, the military staged a, a coup d'etat in Argentina. Uh, they arrested the president, uh, they, they closed down the, the, the Congress, replaced members of the Supreme Court, uh, and that was not a, a dirty war. That was a pure state terrorism. So 
Let me pause uh, for a second and, and tell you about uh, July 5th, 1976. And, and of course, there were many July 5th uh, in that year. I was uh, in, in the political prison of Cordoba uh, that was under the jurisdiction of General Luciano Benjamin Mendo Menendez, one of the most cruel generals uh, during the, this uh, experience. Uh, when suddenly armed soldiers came into the pavilion, uh, into the area of the prison where we uh, were held, uh, into the cells. And they came with, with, making noises, yelling, and, and they, they took us to, to the yard, to the prison yard. About 50 of us were taken to the prison yard. And, and we were there. It, it was in the middle of the winter. It was uh, very cold. Those Argentinian winters are quite cold. And, and at some point, that's when a fellow political prisoner, uh, Raul Bauduco, we used to call him Paco, uh, Paco Bauduco. He was a young uh, journalist uh, student. He fell to the ground, and he fell to the ground. And then a non-commissioned officer uh, came uh, and, and actually uh, started to order him to get up. Uh, the name of this non-commissioned officer, as we found out uh, much later, was uh, Miguel is Miguel Angel de Perez. And when Balduco couldn't get up because he, he was he practically fainted, then he, the parish walked towards the, the center of the yard where the officer who was in charge of the operation, Lieutenant Demones Ruiz, actually the, talked to him and gave him an order. So the parish walked back to where the Paco was, pointed the, the gun to his head and shot him. Yes, shot him in front of all of us. Hmm? Again, I mean, we were between 40 and 50 uh, political prisoners there. And he shot him, and of course, Paco died almost immediately. And then Pablo Balustra, and then Hugo Baca Narvaja, and Florencio Diaz, and René Mocarce, and the list continues of all those who were killed in the political prison of Cordoba, UP1, under the jurisdiction of General Menendez in 1976, 31 political prisoners. I was on the trial in, in 2010, July 2010, when President Videla was the former President Videla, uh, General Menendez, and 28 more uh, military officers who were the many, in many instances, 26 of them were found uh, guilty of crimes against humanity. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. I strongly support reconciliation. I strongly support reconciliation. Let me emphasize that. And also restorative justice programs, because they are a humane alternative to a very dysfunctional criminal justice system, which is the one we have here in the U.S., huh? with more than 2 million people in prison, uh, with uh, institutional racism that uh, leads to about 60% of the prisoners being from members of uh, minority groups, African-Americans, Latinos, with a recidivism rate of uh, about 77%. How could, we, how could we not support restorative justice uh, programs that are a true alternative to punishment, to revenge? However, and let me also emphasize that however, one size fits all programs and initiatives, in my personal opinion, do not work. Reconciliation in Mandela, South Africa, with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, may have been a relatively successful alternative, no doubt, at least in, in creating political stability in that country. But in Argentina, we're talking of different historical circumstances. And if we go to Larry Siegel, a criminologist that talks about the restorative justice programs, there are three prerequisites for this restorative process and reconciliation to succeed. And one that's fundamental is that the offender needs to acknowledge the harm that he or she had caused. And another one is that the offender should actually provide material restitution and symbolic reparation. In Argentina, in every single trial, in every single trial that took place since uh, 1985, the offenders refused to acknowledge their guilt. They refused to provide information about the whereabouts of the 30,000 disappeared and the whereabouts of the 500 babies that were appropriated. 
There's no acknowledgement. There's no shame. There's no apology. Marta Mino, and she's a brilliant human rights scholar who, who teaches at Harvard, uh, talking about uh, reconciliation, she focuses on two dimensions, one being the state, the other one, the individual. And the state, of course, uh, as the embodiment of rational society, has a responsibility to address the harm caused to society. Crimes against humanity cannot, cannot and should not go unpunished. However, when it comes to the individual, it becomes a different story. And to finish, for many in Argentina, for key institutions, including the mothers of Plaza de Mayo, there could be no reconciliation, no forgiveness until, until the military acknowledge their crimes. And also until they disclose the whereabouts of the 30,000 disappeared and the 500 babies that only about 132, I believe, have been tracked forward. Thank you. Well, th thank you, all of the speakers. Uh, thank you, Helen, Professor Taylor, and, and Esther. Um, judging from the, the amount of information and the emotion and the, the passions uh, from the speakers, uh, th this is uh, truly a, a topic that we uh, should continue, and I think we're just barely scratching the surface. And it's so unfortunate that we don't, uh, we, we lost that right and we have a voice from the Native American uh, community. And thank you all the media colleagues and, and everyone who joined this call today. And um, this, um, um, uh, this meeting is, um, is over and um, wish everybody a great, um, uh, a great happy weekend. Thank you.